All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the video lecture for Chapter 3, which is uh, going to cover the topics of interdependence and uh, the gains that we can experience as a society from trade. All right. So let's get started. So in this chapter, you should be looking for the answers to these questions. Why do people and nations, for that matter, choose to be economically interdependent. That is, why do we rely on one another for, uh, for getting the things that we need in our lives? Uh, the next question you want to be able to answer is, how can trade make everyone better off? So that's going to be uh, one of the main focuses of this chapter. Uh, and then lastly, uh, being able to answer these uh, this set of questions. What is absolute advantage? What is comparative advantage? Um, how are they similar and how are they different? So this is what we're going to focus on here. Now as far as interdependence goes, uh, that's just recognizing the fact that uh, every day, uh, everything that you do, um, you are utilizing um, or taking advantage of the fact that um, Many people that, you know, many of whom you've never met are, are working to provide the things that you use in life, right? So we see this picture of this guy here. Uh, he's got his cell phone here. So, of course, that was uh, used, uh, or rather that was uh, built using, um, you know, labor and parts from perhaps Taiwan or China or Korea, perhaps. Uh, we see him drinking a coffee here. Um, so, of course, we know that that involved beans being grown, coffee beans being grown in some other part of the world by workers, uh, perhaps from Kenya. Uh, he's wearing a shirt here that maybe was made in China or India. Um, oh, and look at that. He's maybe even got some hair gel that was manufactured in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, so this is just the nature of independence. Uh, everything around you... Um, you didn't make it, right? Yeah, other people made it. So that's the nature of independence. But of course, if you're working, that means you're, you're helping provide um, goods or services for other people, right? And so you're, you're part of that equation as well. All right, so interdependence. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, this really, uh, this idea that trade can make everyone better off, it was one of the 10 principles we learned in chapter one. Uh, but now we're going to learn why people and nations choose to be interdependent and how they can gain from trade. And we're going to do this by example. Uh, so in our example, we've got two countries, the U.S. and Japan. Uh, and we have two goods, computer and wheat. So, of course, because we're using, we're building a model here, these are simplifying assumptions. Of course, there's many more countries than just you and U.S. and Japan. And there are many other goods besides computers and wheat. But, of course, we know we want to try and simplify this so it's easy to work with. Um, the other assumption we're going to make is that there's only one resource here, and that is labor measured in hours. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at how much uh, of both goods, computers and wheat, each country can produce and consume under two different scenarios. Uh, one scenario being if each country chooses to be self-sufficient and not rely on the other country, or in other words, not be interdependent. And then we're going to look at the scenario where the countries are interdependent and so they are trading with each other. All right, so let's look at uh, production possibilities in the U.S. So we're going to assume just for sake of example, that the U.S. has 50,000 hours of labor available for production each month, uh, and that producing a computer requires 100 hours of labor, while producing one ton of wheat requires only 10 hours of labor. All right, so um, I encourage you to use this information to try and draw uh, the U.S. PPF uh, for this example and then see if it matches uh, uh, as we move on to the next slide. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. Go ahead and pause the video if you need to. Try to draw it out and uh, see if it matches what you get on the next slide. And um, go ahead and put computers on the x-axis. 
All right, so looking at the U.S. PPF, given the data from the previous slide, uh, the U.S. has enough labor to produce as many as 500 computers. So if it spent all of its labor, all of its 50,000 uh, labor hours on computers, it could make 500 computers in a month. Or if it spent all of its labor on wheat, it could make 5,000 tons of wheat. So that's the other end of our PPF. And then we just need to connect them uh, with a straight line. So we are assuming a constant um, opportunity cost here since it's a straight line PPF and not a bowed PPF. All right, so if the U.S. is self-sufficient, um, we're going to make one more assumption here just for sake of example. We're going to assume that the U.S. splits its labor between the two goods. And so it's going to create uh, 250 computers and 2,500 tons of wheat and uh, be right smack in the middle of that PPF. Um, it could choose some other um, point of production on the PPF. We're just choosing the middle for sake of example. Okay, so for, uh, for another learning opportunity, another opportunity for practice, uh, go ahead and derive Japan's PPF. So hopefully you did it for the U.S. Now let's uh, let's go and go ahead and have you do it for Japan as well. So for Japan, uh, we're going to assume thirty thousand hours of labor per month. Uh, we're going to assume that one computer requires one hundred and twenty-five hours of labor from Japan, and that one ton of wheat requires twenty-five hours of labor. And again, put uh, computers on the horizontal axis. So go ahead and pause the video and uh, practice sketching out the PPF for Japan using this information. All right, so let's go ahead and see what Japan's PPF looks like, given the information from the previous slide. So if Japan used all of its labor, it could make 240 computers, or it could make 1,200 tons of wheat, uh, or anything uh, in between, any combination in between along the PPF. So that's what it should look like. Hopefully yours looks uh, identical to this. If not, um, maybe try and get some more practice um, using either uh, the homeworks or, um, or just making up some numbers um, for yourself and, and practicing that way. All right, so assuming that Japan is self-sufficient, uh, let's see, and we're also gonna assume that Japan splits its labor between the two goods, and, and so it's gonna produce and consume 120 computers and 600 tons of wheat and end up right in the middle of its PPF. All right, so that's, that's where we start our first scenario. Uh, and, and then next, we're going to build towards what it might look like if they're able to trade. So, so consumption with and without trade. Without trade, this is what U.S. consumers get, 250 computers and 2,500 tons of wheat. And Japan, Japanese consumers get 120 computers and 600 tons of wheat. We're going to compare this uh, situation without trade to uh, a situation where they're able to trade with one another. Um, but first, before we get there, uh, we need to see how much of each good is produced and traded by the two countries. Okay, so we're going to start. So here's another uh, active learning opportunity for you. So suppose the U.S. produces 3,400 tons of wheat. Uh, how many computers would the U.S. be able to produce with its remaining labor? Okay, so go ahead and you're going to have to figure out how, man, how much labor it would need to produce this 3,400 tons of wheat and then see how much labor it has left over and with that leftover labor, how many computers could it create? And if you need to, you can skip back a few slides. Uh, it's 100 hours per computer is, is what uh, the US works with. So uh, you'll need that information there. And then go ahead and draw that point on the PPF that you drew for the US. Uh, you can pause the video if you need time to do that, um, but once you're done with that, uh, now suppose that Japan produces 240 computers um, and ask yourself uh, how many tons of wheat would Japan be able to produce with its remaining labor and draw that point on Japan's PPF. 
uh, and go ahead and pause the video in order to do that too. Okay, so uh, going with our uh, active learning opportunity there, what does that point look like on the US PPF? Well, uh, producing 3,400 tons of wheat requires 34,000 labor hours, which means that the US would have 16,000 hours left over and could make 160 computers with that amount of labor. And here's what it would look like. It would be this point right here on the PPF. As far as Japan goes, uh, if it makes 240 computers, it uses all of its labor hours and has no time left over to make any wheat, so it's just right here at this extreme end of its PPF. So hopefully that's what you got. All right, so um, one other thing we need to make sure we understand before we look at the trade scenario is we need to understand the difference between exports and imports. Um, there's a good chance you already know, but just in case you don't, exports are goods that are produced domestically, or in other words, here in the home country, and then sold to other countries abroad uh, in other parts of the world. So that's exports, leaving our country, uh, exiting our country, right, exports. Uh, and then imports are goods produced by other countries and then brought into our country uh, here. So sold domestically here in the home country. So those are imports and exports. So make sure you understand the difference there. All right, so now getting to our trade scenario. Suppose the U.S. exports 700 tons of wheat to Japan and imports 110 computers from Japan. Uh, and what this means, conversely, is that Japan therefore imports those 700 tons of wheat from us and exports 110 computers back to us. All right, so here's the questions you should answer for some practice. How much of each good is consumed in the U.S. after the trade? Okay, so we're going to give up 700 tons of wheat and in return get 110 computers. Where does this uh where does this end us up on our PPF graph? Uh, and just to give you a little hint, it might not be a point on the PPF. It might be outside or inside. Okay, so just a little hint there for you. So take a moment to pause the video and figure that out. Uh, and then do the same thing for Japan. Once it gets its 700 tons of wheat and gives us 110 computers in return, uh, at what point of consumption uh, will Japan have? P go ahead and plot that combination on Japan's PPF. And again, it might not be a point on the PPF. Alright, so let's look at U.S. consumption with trade. So here's what it produced, right? Here's the point uh, that we said the U.S. produced at. So 3,400 tons of wheat, 160 computers, um, we are going to import 110 computers from Japan, and we are going to export 700 tons of wheat to Japan. And so uh, we're going to add 110 to 160 here, and we're going to subtract 700 from uh, 3,400. And so what we have available to consume is 270 computers and 2,700 wheat. And when we plot that, it's this blue point right here, which coincidentally, is outside of our PPF. Okay, so hopefully, as you'll recall, this would not be a uh, combination of consumption that would be possible without trade, right? It's outside of the possibilities of U.S. production if the U.S. was self-sufficient and did not trade. But if it's trading, it's able to get outside of its PPF, which, uh, again, they could the U.S. could only achieve this blue point if there was some economic growth, so either more labor hours or some improvement in technology. And then let's look at Japan, see how they do. So here's where they produce originally, just 240 computers and zero wheat. They bring in 700 tons of wheat as an import from us, and they export 110 computers to us. And so they end up with 130 computers and 700 tons of wheat. And just like the U.S., they are also able to get to a point outside of their PPF. So here we go. What we are seeing is that trade can make everyone better off.
All right, so just comparing those scenarios, here's the US, consumption without trade and consumption with trade. With trade, the US is better off by 20 computers and 200 wheat. So we are actually able to get more of both things by trading. And then Japan, by trading, is better off by 10 computers and 100 wheat. So it also is able to get more of both wheat and computers than if they were to try to be self-sufficient and not trade with the U.S. Well, where do these gains come from? That's a logical uh, question. Um, right? And the answer is, uh, it comes from either... It comes from uh, the two countries enjoying um, some kind of advantage. Now, the first type of advantage we need to talk about is absolute advantage. And this is simply the ability for a producer to create a good using fewer, fewer inputs than another producer. So, uh, in this example we've been looking at, the U.S. has an absolute advantage in wheat because producing a ton of wheat uses 10 labor hours in the U.S. versus 25 in Japan. So the U.S. doesn't have to use as many resources um, in order to uh, produce a ton of wheat. Japan has to use more resources. Now, if each country has an absolute advantage in one good, and it specializes in that good, then both countries can gain from trade. Now, the problem is, is that... Um, the U.S. actually has an absolute advantage in both things, both wheat and com uh, computers. So we can't use this rule here to determine who should specialize in what, since the U.S. Uh, has an absolute advantage in both. So this uh, this doesn't. We're not quite yet to where uh, we're not able to see exactly where these gains are yet coming from, because the U.S. has an absolute advantage in both. Right, so there you go. Which country has an absolute advantage in computers? Well, it's still the U.S. It only takes 100 hours in the U.S. to make a computer, where it takes, uh, whereas it takes 125 hours uh, in Japan. So the U.S. has an absolute advantage in both. Um, well, if this is the case, why does Japan specialize in computers, and why do both countries gain from trade? Well, it's not because of absolute advantage. Right, since the U.S. has an absolute advantage in both things. So it must be some other type of advantage that's working here. And uh, really what's, what the, the gains from trade are coming from are the fact that the two uh, countries have different comparative advantages. In other words, each country uh, has a differing um, opportunity cost, which will ultimately here, in this case, be the relevant cost. So while the absolute advantage measures the cost of a good in terms of the inputs required or the resources required, um, what we really need to be thinking about is the cost of production in terms of what it has to give up, right, in terms of opportunity. What is the opportunity cost? So in our example, the opportunity cost of a computer is not going to be the resource hours or the labor hours. It's going to be the amount of wheat that could have been produced using the labor uh, that was instead used to produce a computer. So what we really need to be looking at is comparative advantage, which is the ability to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost. Right. So thinking about opportunity cost rather than the resource cost, which is what absolute advantage has to do with. So now we should ask ourselves, which country has the comparative advantage in computers? Well, if we want to answer this question, then we have to uh, determine the opportunity cost of a computer in each country and compare uh, the opportunity costs. So it's a little bit more tricky to figure out comparative advantage than it is absolute advantage because we have to compute opportunity cost. Well, let's figure that out then. In the U.S., it costs or takes 10, uh, 10 hours to create a ton of wheat and 100 labor hours to create a computer. So if instead of producing one computer, 
the U.S. could take that 100 hours of labor and produce 10 tons of wheat since it takes 10 hours to produce one ton of wheat, right? So 100 labor hours would produce 10 tons of wheat. So in other words, the U.S. has to give up producing 10 tons of wheat if it wants to make a computer. So the opportunity cost of one computer is 10 tons of wheat. Whereas for Japan, producing a computer requires 125 labor hours, which it could use to make 20, uh, 5 tons of wheat because the, um, it takes 25 hours in Japan to make 1 ton of wheat. And so with that 125 hours, it could make 5 tons of wheat rather than making 1 computer. So in terms of opportunity cost, Japan has a lower opportunity cost. It only has to give up 5 tons of wheat, whereas the U.S. has to give up 10 tons of wheat. So the lesson here is that absolute advantage is not necessary for comparative advantage. The U.S. had an absolute advantage in both things, but as it turns out, the Japan has a comparative advantage in producing computers. And this is really what we care about here when thinking about trade and specialization, is we want to know who has the comparative advantage, who has, in other words, the lower opportunity cost. And so this is really where the gains from trade are coming from. They're coming from the fact that Japan has a comparative advantage uh, in computers, which, by the way, means that the U.S. automatically has a comparative advantage in, in wheat. And so the, the gains that we saw in our example were coming from the fact that Japan was, as it turned out, specializing in its comparative advantage. It was only producing computers, and it has a, a lower opportunity cost of producing computers. Now, when each country specializes in the goods in which it has a comparative advantage, total production in all countries is higher, or in other words, the world's economic pie is bigger, and because the pie is bigger, all countries can gain from trade. So really, um, what we should have done in uh, our example is had the U.S. make only wheat and, um, the J and Japan make only computers and then they trade. Um, but as it turned out in our example, uh, the U.S. made a little bit of both. So we weren't maximizing uh, the size of the pie in our example. Um, but we, we could have if, if we had the U.S. entirely specialize in wheat. Okay, um, now this can work for countries. It can also work for in individuals, right? So we could apply the same logic here to individuals such as Farmer Frank and Rancher Rose, um, who could also specialize and benefit from specializing and then trading. All right, um, let's do one more active learning um, exercise here. So just to get some practice with these things, let's assume that Argentina and Brazil both have 10,000 hours of labor per month, and in Argentina, producing one pound of coffee requires two hours, while producing one bottle of wine requires four hours, and in Brazil, producing one pound of coffee requires one hour, and producing one bottle of wine requires five hours. Now, given that information, answer these questions. Which country has an absolute advantage in coffee, and which country has a comparative advantage in wine? So go ahead, pause the video, and answer these questions. All right, so let's take a look at the answers. As it turns out, Brazil has an absolute advantage in coffee. Uh, and that's because producing a pound of coffee in Brazil only requires one hour of labor, while as in Argentina, it requires two. So Brazil has the lower resource cost of producing coffee, so it has the absolute advantage. But of course, we know now that what we really care about is comparative advantage, right? Looking at opportunity cost instead of resource cost. So for Argentina, they have the comparative advantage in wine, and that's because Argentina's opportunity cost of wine is two pounds of coffee, whereas uh, the opportunity cost uh, for uh, Brazil is, I believe, four pounds of coffee. So Argentina has a 
lower opportunity cost uh, of producing wine than does Brazil. I'm sorry, Brazil's opportunity cost is five pounds of coffee, not four, five pounds. But still bigger, right? Um, so if you're having trouble understanding why this is the case, uh, feel free to text me or email me and I'll try to clarify these things. Uh, and we'll probably go over this in class too next time we meet. Um, so to wrap up this chapter, um, we just want to discuss real quick some unanswered questions that kind of lead us to the next chapter. So we made a lot of assumptions about things like the quantities of each good that each country produces. We made some assumptions about the quantities that they trade and consume. And also we made some uh, assumptions, although we didn't talk about it, about the prices at which they trade. Um, in the real world, these quantities and prices are determined by the preferences of consumers, a.k.a. via demand, uh, as well as the technology and resources, a.k.a. the supply. So these are things that we're going to look at and begin to study in the next chapter. Um, but for now, our goal, of course, was merely to see how trade can make everyone better off, which is what we accomplished. So uh, just to summarize what we learned here, uh, we looked at how interdependence and trade allow everyone to enjoy a greater quantity and as well as variety of goods and services, as it turns out. Um, we learned about comparative advantage and how that means uh, being able to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost, which is really what we care about. Um, and we, we contrasted that to absolute advantage, which is just being able to produce uh, something with fewer inputs or fewer resources. And we also saw how that when people or countries specialize in goods in which they have a comparative advantage, uh, that allows the economic pie to be bigger, and therefore um, uh, it allows for countries to be better off after they specialize and then trade. All right, cool. So that was Chapter 3. If you guys have any questions for me, uh, just reach out to me via text or email, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and then otherwise, I will see you next Saturday for our in-person class meeting. Thanks for watching.